and welcome to Emergency Care in the Streets, Chapter 29, Trauma Systems and Mechanisms of Injury. Basic concepts of the mechanism and biomechanics of trauma will help you analyze and manage your patient's injuries. Analyzing a trauma scene is a vital skill because at the scene, you are the eyes and ears of the emergency department physicians. The paramedic written patient history is the only source for physicians and surgeons to understand the events and mechanisms that led to your trauma patient's chief complaint. Your information is critical as a foundation to visualize and search for injuries that may not be apparent on physical exam. So let's get started. Trauma is the primary cause of death and disability in patients and people between the ages of 1 and 44 years old. Basic concepts of mechanics and biomechanics of trauma will help you analyze and manage your patient's injuries. Analyzing a trauma scene is vital. You are the eyes and ears, as we said earlier, of the emergency department physicians, and your patient history is the only source for, for the, these physicians. So let's talk about trauma, energy, and kinetics. Trauma is an acute physiologic and structural change that occurs when an external source of energy affects the body beyond its ability to sustain and dis dissipate it. There are different forms of energy and they produce different forms of trauma. So we're going to talk about these forms of energy. First one we're going to talk about is mechanical, and that is um, energy from motion, so kinetic energy. For example, two moving vehicles colliding, or there's also energy stored in an object, and that's that potential energy. For example, a brick sitting on a building ledge. Then you have chemical energy, and that's energy released as a result of a chemical reaction, for example, an explosion or an acid. There's thermal energy, and that's energy transferred from sources that are hotter than the body. For example, a flame, hot water, or steam. You have electrical energy, and that's, uh, for example, electrocution or a lightning strike. And a barometric energy, and that's a sudden radical change in pressure. For example, scuba diving or flying. Biomechanics is the study of the physiology and mechanics of living organisms using tools of mechanical engineering. It can be used to help analyze the mechanisms of and results of trauma. And kinetics is a study of the relationship among speed, mass, direction of force, and physical injury caused by these factors. And it can be used to help predict injury patterns. Okay, so next we're going to talk about some factors affecting types of injuries. The kind of injury sustained will be determined by the ability of the patient's body to disperse the energy delivered. External factors that determine types of energy include source and energy. So it's the size, and that's known as the mass of the object delivering the force. The velocity, that's how fast the object was moving acceleration or deceleration, and that's how fast the object speeds up or slows down, and the body area affected by the application of the force. The duration or direction are also important factors. The larger the area of force dissipation, the more pressure is reduced to the specific spot in the body. So blunt trauma, spreading of impact without breaking the skin, is difficult to, to diagnose. It's often um, little external damage, and its rapidly applied amounts of energy are less tolerated than the same amount of energy delivered over a long period of time. The position of the trauma victim at the time of the event is another external factor. Seatbelt use has reduced lethal injuries by keeping victims in safer positions. The impact resistance of body parts has been has a bearing on types of tissue disruption as well, often determined by what's inside the patient's organs. So organs that have gas inside will shatter energy uh, more than liquid or solid boundaries and are easily compressed. So lungs and gastrointestinal tracts. Liquid containing organs are less compressible 
so vascular system, liver, spleen, and muscle. Understanding the effects of forces will help to assess the mechanism of injury. And you can help predict most likely the type of injury. Paramedics should have a high index of suspicion for injuries that may be undetected. Be quick and deliberate with your primary survey and interventions. Okay, so let's talk about everybody's favorite, kinetics. First, we're gonna talk about velocity. That's the distance an object travels per unit of time. And then there's the acceleration. That's the rate of change of velocity an object is subject to. Next, we're gonna talk about gravity, and that's the downward acceleration imparted to any object moving towards Earth. During each second of a fall, the velocity or speed of the falling object increases by 9.8 mass per second squared. Kinetic energy is associated with an object in motion. It reflects the relationship between the weight of the object and the velocity at which it's traveling. And velocity has a much greater effect than mass. Okay, the kinetic energy of a car in motion that stops suddenly must be transferred or applied to another object. Modern cars have crumple, crumple zones to maximize the amount of energy absorbed by deformation before the passenger is involved. Okay, other factors that will affect the amount of energy dissipation in a crash vehicle include the vehicle's angle, ang angle of an object, uh, front impact versus side impact, or how the patient hits the inside of the automobile, and differences in sizes of the two vehicles or restraint status and protective gear of the occupants. Each vehicle involved contributes kinetic energy to the crash. Law of conservation of energy. So energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only be changed. Um, and so energy dissipation is the process of kinetic energy is transferred into a form of mechanical injury in energy. If a car stops slowly, kinetic energy is converted to thermal energy. If a car crashes, kinetic energy is also converted into mechanical energy. So mechanical energy is further dissipated in the form of an injury. Protective devices can manipulate the way in which the energy is dissipated. Stuff like seat belts and airbags or helmets. Newton's first law of motion is a body at rest will remain at rest unless acted on it by an outside force. And similarly, a body in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted on it by an outside force. Newton's second law of motion is the force of an object can exert in the product of its mass times its acceleration. So it's written um, as on the slide, force equals mass times acceleration. The higher an object's mass and acceleration, the higher the force needed to make a change of course. So deceleration is a slowing down or sl slowing to a stop. Acceleration and deceleration can be measured in numbers of g-force. 1 g-force is normal acceleration due to gravity. 2 or 3 g-force is 2 or 3 times the force associated with gravity. The human limit to deceleration is 30 g-force. In a head-on crash, transfer energy is represented as the sum of both vehicles' speed. Okay, so multi-system trauma describes injuries that involve several body systems the body has a much harder time dealing with multiple injuries that involve several major body areas generally caused by events that affect the entire body often blunt both blunt and tra penetrating trauma occurs if you suspect that multi body systems are infected assess the patient's, patient's entire body and prioritize the treatment of the injuries and transport patients without delay. First, we're gonna talk about blunt trauma. Blunt trauma refers to injuries in which the tissues are not penetrated by external objects. So commonly occurs in motor vehicle accidents or pedestrian hit by a vehicle, 
motorcycle crashes or falls from heights, sports injuries, or blasts when no shrapnel is involved. First, we're going to talk about motor vehicle crashes. So there are five phases of trauma tied to the effects of progressive deceleration when a vehicle collides with another object. Phase one is deceleration of the vehicle. The vehicle strikes another object and is brought to an abrupt stop. The vehicle motion continues until kinetic energy is dissipated. Phase two is deceleration of the occupant and it starts during the sudden braking and continues during the impact of the crash. The results in deceleration, compression, and shear trauma depend on the mass of the occupant, the mechanisms, the protective mechanisms, body parts involved, and the points of impact. Next, we're gonna talk about phase three. It's deceleration of the internal organs. The body supporting structures and movable organs continue the forward momentum until stopped by anatomic restraints. It may result in tears and shearing injuries. Phase four is those secondary collisions. That's the occupant hit by moving objects in the vehicle, such as loose packages or objects or other passengers. And phase five is additional impacts received by the vehicle. So a vehicle may be hit by a second vehicle or a vehicle deflected into another vehicle or tree or object. So when you talk about trauma, we need to talk about impact patterns. How dented and deformed the vehicle looks is an indication of the forces involved and the degree of deceleration sustained by the patient. Dents and deformity on the inside of the vehicle will show you the point of impact on the patient. Head injury or belt marks indicate what parts of the body may have been involved. And tire skid marks at the scene indicate whether significant energy was dissipated by braking before the crash. Front or head-on impacts. The front end of the car distorts as it dis dissipates the kinetic energy and decelerates its forward motion. Passengers decelerate at the same rate as the vehicle. Forces applied to the driver will differ based on the car design and the materials. Abrupt deceleration injuries are produced by a sudden stop of the body's forward motion. It can induce shearing, avulsing, or rupturing of organs. Injuries are often visible during exam. The head is vulnerable in deceleration injuries. It can cause the brain to strike the inside of the skull, causing bleeding, bruising, and tearing injuries. The aorta is the most common site of a deceleration injury in the chest. Often torn away from its points of fixation to the body can result in the loss of total blood volume and immediate death. Also internal organs that continue their motion after motion of the body stops can result in tearing and shearing injuries. Commonly, the liver, kidneys, large intestines, pancreas, and spleen. Crush and compression injuries are as a result of forces applied to the body by other things external to the body. So often dashboards or windshields or the floor or heavy objects falling on the body. So assume spinal cord injuries and severe brain injuries. Compression injuries of the head may result in a skull fracture. Compression injuries of the chest may produce fractured ribs. And compression of the heart may cause dysrhythmias and direct injury to the heart muscle. And compression of the legs can result in acute respiratory distress syndromes. Unrestrained occupants usually follow one of two trajectories. Down and under pathway and this is the occupant slides under the steering column or dash, the knees hit the dashboard, energy of deceleration is transmitted up the femurs to the pelvis and upper torso continues forward until the impacts the vehicle. You wanna look for fractures or dislocations of the knees, hip and pelvic fractures, hip dislocations, spinal injuries, rib fractures, or pulmonary and cardiovascular injuries. After the down and under pathway, it's the up and over pathway. That's the lead. The lead point is the head. The head impacts the windshield, roof, mirror, or dashboard. 
It can include significant head and cervical spine trauma, and also ejection is possible if the windshield does not stop the body. A dangerous lung injury may occur if your patient's reflectivity takes a deep breath just before impact, and lower leg fractures could be present. Next, we're going to talk about after the front or head-on impacts is the lateral or side impacts. Impart energy to the near side it, occupant directly to the goes to the pelvis and chest. Seat belts offer little protection because they are designed to limit forward hinging injuries. As the passenger compartment deforms, the passenger's head can strike the impacting vehicle or object. And of course, there could be direct trauma or tension uh, developed on the far side. The shoulder frequently rotates forward, exposing the chest and ribs to injury. The passenger's body is pushed in one direction when the head moves towards the impacting object. Passengers travel, travel in opposite directions, often colliding with each other. And death is usually the result of associated torso and head injuries. Next, we're going to talk about rear impact and they have the most survivors if the driver and passengers are properly restrained. Whiplash, whiplash injury from the sudden forward acceleration force caused the body to move forward, but not the head, and energy is imported to the front vehicle. And then there's rotational or chordal panel impacts. And so it occurs when a lateral crash is off center. The point where the vehicle's greatest loss of speed occurs is where the greatest damage to the occupant will occur. And occupants tend to receive frontal and lateral injuries. Three-point seatbelts are effective in preventing injuries in angled crashes of up to 45 degrees. And then there's the rollovers. This has the greatest potential for lethal energy. Patients may be ejected and patients may be struck hard against the interior of the vehicle. Ejection increases the chance of death by eight times. Unrestrained versus restrained occupants. So seat belts stop the motion of any automobile occupant who is traveling at the same speed of the vehicle. It limits the contact of the occupants with the interior of the vehicle and it prevents ejection. So specific injuries associated with seat belts use include cervical fractures and neck sprains. Most serious injuries occur because the patient did not use the seatbelt correctly. Airbags have reportedly reduced deaths in frontal crashes by about 30 percent. Front airbags will not activate in a side impact crash or impacts in the front corner panel. It can also result in secondary injuries from direct contact or from the chemicals used to inflate it. And small children can be severely injured or killed if the airbags inflate while they're in the front seat. Okay, next we're going to talk about motorcycle crashes. So any structural protection afforded to the victim is derived from the protective devices worn by the rider. So helmet or leather or abrasion resistant clothing and boots. And the helmet of course protects against impact forces just to the head and it transmits impact into the cervical spine. When assessing the scene, attention should be given to the deformity of the motorcycle and the side of most damage, distance of skin in the road, deformity of stationary objects or other objects and the extent and location of the deformity of the helmet. There are four types of motorcycle impact. There's the head-on, angular impact. Then you also have the ejection or laying the bike down. So let's talk a little bit about those next. When it comes to head-on impact, the motorcycle strikes another object and stops its forward motion. The rider continues forward until it's stopped by an outside force. For motorcycles with low riding seat, the gas tank can act as a wedge on the pelvis, and it can result in an anterior posterior compression injuries or an open pelvic fracture. Angular impact is when the motorcycle strikes an object or another object or vehicle at an angle. 
the rider sustains direct crushing injuries to the lower extremity between the object and the motorcycle. It could result in severe open or community lower extremity fractures or traumatic amputations of those lower extremities. Next is the ejection. So rider who will travel at a high rate of speed until stopped by a stationary object or another vehicle or by contact with the road and usually severe abrasions um, down um, the bones can occur. And then the last one is laying the bike down. That's a technique used to separate the rider from the body of the motorcycle and the object to be hit. It's developed by motorcycle racers, racers as a means of controlling a crash. The motorcycle is turned flat and tipped sideways at a 90 degree uh, direction of travel so that one leg is dropped to the ground. It slows um, the rider faster than the motorcycle, allowing the rider to be separated from the motorcycle. The helmet should be removed carefully if the airway management techniques cannot be performed with the helmet in place. And also if the helmet does not fit snugly to the head, you need to remove the motorcycle helmet. The helmet should be cut if it cannot be removed without introducing further deform deformation to the neck. So um, bicycles and off-road vehicles such as four-wheelers or snowmobiles are capable of producing injuries similar to those of motorcycles. Okay, so we've talked about car crashes, we've talked about motorcycle crashes. Now we're going to get into the pedestrian injuries. Almost 85% of pedestrians are struck by a vehicle's front end. Adult injuries are generally lateral and posterior. They tend to turn to the side or away from an object. And children face forward into the oncoming vehicle. There are three prominent mechanisms of injury. So you have the first impact, the second impact, and the third impact. The first impact is the, when the auto strikes an adult body and its bumpers. Second is when the adult is thrown on the hood or the grill. And the third is when the body strikes the ground or some other object it has been um, um, subjected to by the sudden acceleration of the colliding vehicle. Pedestrian patterns of pedestrian injury are different from adults. Okay, so the Waddell triad refers to a pattern of injuries in children and people of short stature. So this is when the bumper hits the pelvis and femur instead of the knees and tibias. The chest and abdomen hit the grill or low on the hood of the car. The head strikes the vehicle and then the ground. And this could result in skull and facial fractures, facial abrasions, and closed head injuries. Okay, so after pedestrian injuries, we're going to talk about falls from heights next. And remember, the fall produces an acceleration downward. The severity of the injuries affected um, are affected by the height and the position. Okay, so the height will determine the velocity of the fall. The height plus stopping distance predicts the magnitude of the deceleration forces. Okay, so the position will determine the type of injury sustained and the likelihood of survivability. Children tend to fall head first, and this results in head injuries. And adults usually try to land on their feet. Okay, and so there is a Don Juan syndrome or lover's leap, and it's a group of potential injuries from a vertical fall to a standing position. So you have foot and lower extremity fractures, hip, then vertebrae ex, um, compression, and then fractures of the forearm and wrist. Okay, so the area, the larger the area of contact, the greater the dissipation of force. Then the surface that the person lands on, so the degree to which the surface can deform under the force of the body can help dissipate forces of sudden deceleration. If the surface does not conform, the body will. And then there's physical conditions. So pre-existing medical conditions could influence injury sustained. Osteoporosis is the most notable. It predisposes to fractures, even with minimal forces. So, and hematologic conditions are prone to ruptures, spleen in the fall. All right, so we did falls from heights. Now we're gonna talk about penetrating injuries. 
So penetrating trauma involves a distribution of the skin and underlying tissues in a small focused area, usually caused by firearms, knives, and other devices used as a means to cause intentional or accidental harm. It's classified as low, medium, or high velocity. And so we'll talk about low velocity first. And the, the injury is caused by sharp edges of the object moving through the body. When it comes to medium and high velocity, such as a bullet, the path of the object might not be easily to predict because uh, it might flatten out, tumble, or even ricochet within the body. In the United States, the most common sources of penetrating injuries are firearms. In 2013, 33,636 people died by gunfire in the United States. Stab wounds. So the severity depends on the region involved, the depth of the penetration, the blade length, and the angle of penetration. It may also involve a cutting or hacking type force such as machete wounds. Neck wounds can involve critical anatomic structures and deep neck wounds can result in spinal cord involvement or cervical fractures and the pattern of the stab wound closely relates to the mechanisms involved and should be documented in detail. Gunshot wounds, so the severity of the gunshot wound depends on several factors, the type of the firearm, the velocity of the projectile, the physical design and the size of the projectile, and the distance of the victim from the muzzle of the firearm type of tissue that is struck. We have shotguns and they fire round pellets. The shot density can uh, induce destructive injuries at a very close range. Then there's rifles. They fire single projectiles at high velocities. Um, they have groove barrel imports, a spine to the projectile for accuracy. And then there's handguns. So revolvers, hold five to 10 rounds. The pistol holds about 17 rounds and uh, rifled barrel imports spin to the bullet, but accuracy is limited. And um, ammunition is generally less powerful than rifles and fires at a lower velocity. When you talk about ballistics, that's the study of non-powered objects in flight. So most often associated with rifle or handgun bullet travel, when the bullet leaves the barrel of the gun, gravity begins to pull it towards the earth. Trajectory is the curve of the bullet's path related to how fast it falls to the earth after leaving the barrel. Air creates drag on the bullet as it moves through the air. So automatic weapons use the back pressure from firing a bullet to eject the spent cartridge. The same mechanism loads the next round into the chamber to be fired. Fully automatic weapons fire each round as soon as it's loaded into the chamber, as long as the trigger is held down. And um, it's rarely found outside the military. The trigger must be pulled and released each time a new round is loaded for a semi-automatic weapon to be fired. The most important factor for seriousness of gunshot wound is the type of tissue through which the projectile passes. Entrance wounds are characterized by the effects of the initial contact in implosion. So skin and tissues are pushed in, cut, and abraded. At close range, tattoo marks from powder burns can occur. And at closer range, burns can occur from the muzzle blast. Deformation and tissue destruction is based on a combination of factors. So the density, the compressibility, the missile velocity, and the missile fragmentation. Okay. And continuing in with gunshot wounds, the projectile crushes the tissue during penetration. It creates a permanent cavity, and it may be a straight, simple, or a regular pattern. So the pathway expansion, that's the tissue displacement that occurs as a result of the low displacement sonic pressures that travel at the speed of sound in tissue. Bowel, muscle, and lungs are relatively elastic, resulting in fewer permanent effects of temporary cavita cavitation. Liver, spleen, and brain are relatively inelastic, resulting in a more permanent effects of that cavity. Missile fragmentation, that's the projectile when it sends off fragments to create their own separate paths through those tissues.
Exit wounds occur when the projectile has sufficient energy that is not entirely dissipated along its trajectory through the body. The size depends on the energy dissipated and the degree of cavitation at the point of exit. Usually has irregular edges and it may be larger than entry wounds. So shotgun wounds are the result of tissue impact by numerous projectiles. The greater the distance of the muzzle from the target, the more dispersion the projectiles will have. And wounding potential depends on the powder charge, the size and number of pellets, and the dispersion of the pellets. Okay, after talking about gunshot wounds, next we're going to talk about blast injuries. And there's four different types or categories of blast injuries, and we're going to um, discuss those next. The first one is the primary blast injury, and this is damage to the body. It's caused by the pressure wave generated by the explosion. Organs generally are, that are affected are the lungs and eardrums and other compressible organs. Close proximity to the origin of the pressure wave carries a high risk of injury and death. Then there's the secondary blast injuries. It results from being struck by flying debris. Objects can travel great distances and can be propelled at tremendous speeds, up to nearly 3,000 miles per hour for conventional military explosives. A blast wind occurs as a shock wave applies force to air molecules, and flying debris can cause blunt and penetrating injuries. And then you have the third type, that's the tertiary blast injury. It occurs when a person is hurled by the force or the explosion. A ground shock is a physical displacement of the body when the body impacts the ground. It results in injuries are numerous and may be blunt and or penetrating. You have the fourth type of injury. It's the miscellaneous blast injury, and it results from miscellaneous events that occur during the explosion, such as burns from the hot gases or fires started by the blast, perhaps respiratory injury from inhaling toxic gases, also crush injury from the collapse of the buildings, and there's risks for entrapment. Then you have oh, the fifth blast injury, and that is caused by the biologic, chemical, or radioactive contaminants that have been added to a traditional explosive device. It's associated with dirty bombs, and there's an increased concern to the threat of use by terrorist organizations. The figure on this slide shows the mechanisms of those blast injuries. You can see the, the five different types. All right, so let's talk about the physics of explosion. When a substance is detonated, it is converted into large volumes of gas under pressure. Propellants are explosive designed to release energy relatively slowly compared to high explosives. So components of blast shock wave is the blast front. That's the leading edge of the explosion pressure blast wave. Then you have the positive wave pulse. That's a phase of the explosion in which there is a front higher than the atmospheric pressure. You also have shock waves, and those are high explosive blast waves. And then you have negative wave pulse, and that's a phase in which the pressure is less than atmospheric. It occurs as the air displaced by the pressure wave pulse returns to fill the space. The speed, duration, and pressure of the shock wave are affected by the size of the explosive's charge, the nature surrounding the medium, the distance, and the, pres the presence or absence of reflecting surfaces. An explosion is more damaging in closed spaces, and a blast pressure causes destruction at interference between tissue and different densities, or of different densities, and the interference between tissue and trapped air. Tissues at risk are air-containing organs, and are they're more susceptible to pressure changes such as the middle ear, the heart, lungs, major blood vessels, and the GI tract. Junctions between tissues of different densities and exposed tissues are prone as well. The ear is the most sensitive to blast injuries. The tympanic membrane will rupture at pressures of 5 to 7 psi above atmospheric pressure. Patients may complain of ringing in their ears, pain in their ears, loss of hearing, or visible blood in the ear canal. Primary pulmonary blast injuries occur as concussions and hemorrhages. So patients may have tightness in their chest, tachypnea or other signs of respiratory distress, or subcutaneous emphysema, 
and that is uh, indicates an underlying pneumo or also pulmonary edema. If there are any reason to suspect lung injury in a blast victim, administer oxygen. Avoid giving oxygen, though, under pressure, and IV fluids may be poorly tolerated in patients with a lung injury. Arterial air emboli occurs on alveolar disruption with subsequent air embolism into pulmonary vasculature, one of the most concerning pulmonary blast injuries. Even small air bubbles can enter a coronary artery and cause a myocardial injury. Solid organs are relatively protected from shockwave injury, but may be injured by secondary missiles or when the body's hurled. Neurologic injuries and head trauma are the most common causes of death from blast injuries. Extremity injuries, including traumatic amputations, are common. And blast injuries are more common today due to increased use of explosive as a tool for urban terrorism and methamphetamine lab explosions. Assessment and management of blast injuries. So when you are at the scene of an explosion, expect significant trauma and multiple victims. If the explosion was intentional, examine for an area for a secondary device and assess the scene for hazards, exposed electrical wiring or structural instability, shop or sharp objects. And assess breath sounds frequently. Examine the patient rapidly for the presence of DCAP BTLS and establish baseline pulse ox value and reassess frequently. An absent of avert signs of abdominal injury should not lead you to conclude that the injury is not present. Dizziness due to ear injuries may lead to vomiting and can interfere with the patient's airway pat patency and protection. Okay, so let's talk about the assessments. All right, so general assessment for this for trauma. Managing a trauma scene involves more consideration of external factors than the typical scene with a medical patient. Your observations are critical to hospital staff. Very few trauma injuries can be truly stabilized on scene. So start with your scene size up, of course. Attention to personal protective equipment is required gloves, and the likelihood of bleeding is higher in trauma patients. Also, eyewear or helmets or heavy coats or boots could be needed. Anticipate possible scene hazards while en route and call for assistance before you need them. Assess your environment, clearly, um, environment carefully, and as you approach your patient, consider whether you need additional medical resources. The primary survey, so of course, form that general impression Patients who look very ill or present with obvious bleeding injuries often have serious injuries. Do not make major patient decisions based strictly on your first impression. Keep the mechanism of injury in mind as you approach and evaluate the patient using AVPU. If the patient does not require CPR and does not have life-threatening hemorrhages, next assessed airway status. Okay, so airway and breathing. If your patient is unresponsive, ask your partner to open the airway using the jaw thrust maneuver. Observe for obvious oral and facial trauma that may contribute to an airway obstruction. If necessary, remove foreign objects and suction out blood or vomit. If the patient's unresponsive, consider an oral or nasal pharyngeal airway. If you suspect blockage due to a foreign object, apply the appropriate manual airway clearing technique. If the airway is clear, assess the patient's breathing. Absence of breathing will require the bag valve mask and consider of a more advanced airway adjunct. But if the patient is breathing, note the right rhythm and quality of the respirations and the patient's ability to speak. Next, you're going to note the skin color and observe chest wall movement with respirations. Assess the thorax and neck. You're looking for trachea deviation, tension pneumo, neck and chest crep crepitation, broken ribs, fractured sternums, and other problems that may inhibit breathing. Determine how to best support your patient's breathing. Most trauma patients will benefit from application of oxygen, even in the present um, absence of dyspnea. And then after the A's and the B's, you're on to the C's. So check both radial and carotid pulses simultaneously to estimate blood pressure and pulse. Note rate and quality of pulse. 
and skin condition can also be a good indicator for circulation. Quickly scan for significant external bleeding. Assess for disability. You want to evaluate the Glasgow Coma Score. Note pupil size equal in reactivity to light. Evaluate pulse motor and sensation in all extremities. And expose the patient for exam. Scan quickly for life threats and manage life threats as you find them. And then is your D. So A, B, C, D, we're going to do that transport decision. Patients that should be categorized for immediate transport include those with altered mental status, airway and breathing problems, multi-system trauma, and the um, compromised circulation. If a patient needs immediate transport, continue your assessment and route to the trauma center. On-scene time should be limited to 10 minutes or less. You want to, re that's referred to the Platinum 10. And after the first 60 minutes in shock, the body has increased difficulty compensating. And that's referred to as the golden hour, the first 60 minutes. After your primary is your history. And the history is a sample, remember, an OPQRST. Sample is the history of the patient. So the medical history should be obtained as soon as possible in case the patient's level of consciousness deteriorates. If the patient's unresponsive, you need to gather the info from the bystanders or family members if you can. Important information is remember allergies, medications, past medical history, patient's last oral intake, or events leading up to the situation. Your secondary assessment for trauma patients are classified into two major groups, those with an isolated injury, and this is going to allow you to immediately focus on that problem, or those with multi-system trauma. So you must first find all the various problems, then prioritize the severity, and think about how each injury or condition relates to the others. And then, of course, is the vital signs. And that's when you want to obtain a full set of initial or baseline vital signs. And you should include the assessment of pulse, respiratory or respirations, and um, blood pressures. And other measurements that should be considered are pulse ox, BGL, cardiac monitoring, and automatic blood pressure monitoring. With your physical exams, most Multi-system traumatic injury patients should have a thorough physical exam prior to transport. It should be done in a systemic manner. You're going to work from the head to the toes, and you're going to go down and look for any DCAP BTLS. Now, DCAP BTLS stands for deformities, contusions, abrasions, penetrations, burns tenderness, lacerations, and swelling. When you start at the head, you're going to start and check the nose, mouth, ears for bleeding. Re-examine the pupils for size equality and re reactivity to light. Check the, for JVD and tracheal deviation. Press a finger down in the notch at the top of the sternum. If the trachea is palpated in its position, it's midline. If it's to one side, it's deviated. Consider applying a C collar when you, and then continue your assessment. Move down to the chest. You want to expect so and palpate the chest wall. Look for penetrating injuries and assess for bruising. Use your stethoscope to listen to breath and heart sounds. Palpate the abdomen across the upper and lower quadrants. Press the iliac crest down and squeeze them inward to determine pelvic stability and consider palpation of the pubic synthesis. Examine for signs of incontinence or bleeding from the groin area. When you move down to the extremities, you're gonna palpate the legs from top to bottom. Palpate each leg separately and note the difference. You have to um, check both feet for distal pulses, motion and sensation, and then the back while the patient is on his or her side, examine for back injuries. You're going to reassess the patient and route to the hospital. And you want to perform another full body rapid scan. Repeat the primary survey and reevaluate vital signs every five minutes for patients in serious conditions. Review the status of the interventions that you've performed and notify hospital staff as quickly as possible. Next, we're going to talk about the trauma score.
trauma scoring systems are often used to determine injury severity in healthcare profession. There are several different systems. Trauma score is used to determine the likelihood of the patient's survival. Calculated on a scale from 1 to 16, 16 is the best score. Takes into account the Glasgow Coma Score, the respiratory rate, respiratory expansion, and systolic blood pressure and cap refill. And then there's the Glasgow Coma Score, and that is an evaluation tool used to determine the level of consciousness. Its scores are assigned for eye opening, verbal response, and motor response, and it can be used to predict patient outcome as well. It does not accurately predict survivability, though, in patients with head injuries. In these instances, the revised trauma score is used, which leads us to talking about the revised trauma score, or RTS. It is a score used to assess injury severity in patients with head trauma. It's heavily weighted on um, compensation for major head injury with multi-system injury and major physiologic changes. The data used to calculate the score is a Glasgow coma score, the systolic blood pressure, and the respiratory rate. And so all um, also used to predict survival in patients with severe injuries. So the highest revised trauma score is 12 and the lowest is a zero. And you could see the table and the elements, elements of the revised trauma score calc. So management of trauma. So the management of trauma requires an accurate assessment of the patient and the knowledge of the mechanics of injury. During transport, begin any necessary interventions. Most trauma patients will need to be treated for shock, and that includes establishing IVs, administering fluid boluses, and transporting rapidly. Unresponsive trauma patients will most likely need an advanced airway placed. And most patients who are in shock should include oxygen, keep supine with extremities slightly elevated, and transport rapidly to a trauma center. You want to um, also consider fluid resuscitation. Um, if shock is caused by a large fluid shift, and large quantities of fluid may be required. If shock is caused by blood loss, too much fluid can dilute the blood and raise blood pressure. Okay, so consult with medical control. Begin fluid resuscitation at volumes that maintain a minimum blood pressure. And this will still allow clots to form at sites of bleeding within the body. Several techniques can be used to treat multi-system trauma. Multi-system trauma patients cannot be stabilized in the field. Use a team approach to assess and transport your patient. Critical thinking is important when treating a patient with multi-system trauma. Signs and symptoms may be related to different response mechanisms. Okay, so let's talk about the trauma lethal triad next. And um, the, the triad consists of hypothermia, poor blood clotting, and acidosis. And so even mildly hypothermic patients have a lower survival rate than normothermic patients. And hypothermia tr um, contributes to coagulopathy. And that's poor blood clotting. So any factor that interferes with blood clotting will cause greater blood loss. And that, of course, results in poor perfusion and ultimately death. Then the third uh, side of that triangle, it's uh, acidos acidosis. And it often occurs with excessive bleeding and treatment to compensate for it. Uh, it contributes to um, poor blood clotting and com complicates treatment. So management, we're going to aggressively seek to control the bleeding to the best of our ability. We have to keep patients warm and minimize the volume of acidotic IV fluids that we administer. So the criteria for referral to a trauma center. The American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma and Centers for Disease Control and Prevention published a field triage decision scheme. So physiologic criteria. If one of the following is present, refer to the highest level trauma center. A GCS score of less than 13, systolic blood pressure of less than 90, and a respiratory rate less than 10 or more than 29, or the need for ventilatory support. An autotomic criteria. So if one or more of the following is present, we need to transport to the highest level of trauma center. A penetrating trauma to the head, neck, or torso 
and extremities proximal to the elbow or wrist, chest wall instability or deformity, two or more proximal long bone fractures, crushed, degloved, mangled, or pulseless extremity, amputation proximal to the wrist or ankle, pelvic fracture, or open or depressed skull fracture, also paralysis. Mechanism criteria. So if one or more of the following is present, and depending on the mechanism of the injury, they want you to transport to the closest trauma center. Adults who fall more than 20 feet, children falls more than 10 feet or two to three times the height of the child, and high-risk motor vehicle accidents. So if there's intrusion into the passenger compartment, ejection, partial or complete, from an automobile, and vehicle telemetry data consists with a high risk of injury. Pedestrian and bicyclist thrown or run over or on a pedestrian injury with significant impact or a motorcycle crash at more than 20 miles an hour. Also, there are special considerations to go to the trauma facility. If the patient's age is more than 55, systolic blood pressure is less than 110 in a person older than 65. Children should be triaged to a pediatric compatible trauma center and patient uses anticoagulants or has bleeding disorder, or a patient who is pregnant more than 20 weeks gestation. Low impact mechanisms in older adults may result in severe injury and burns with other trauma. It's also an EMS provider judgment. The ACS COT publishes a list of criteria defining four separate levels of trauma centers. There's one, two, three, and four. It is important to know which hospitals specialize in neurology, burns, pediatric trauma, cardiac care, microsurgery, or hyperbaric chamber therapy. You want to give the trauma center early notice of the patient's arrival, including the age, sex, mechanism of injury, vital signs, Glasgow coma score, whether the patient's innovated, sample history, or significant comorbidities, or estimated time of arrival as well. The table shows the definitions of the levels of trauma centers and your mode of transport. So when making the decision to transport by ground, several factors should be considered. Can the appropriate facility be reached within a reasonable time frame, the extent of the injuries, and if it's in a congested area? Criteria for appropriate use of emergency air medical services include the extended period required to access or extricate a remote or trapped patient, that uh, um, the time frame to get the patient to the trauma center by ground, um, that it depletes it. So distance to the trauma center is greater than 20 or 25 miles, or the patient needs medical care and stabilization at an advanced life support level, and there are no ALS ground units available. The traffic conditions also and the hospital availability make it unlikely that the patient will get a trauma center by ground in a good time frame. And um, there are multiple patients who will overwhelm resources at the trauma center. EMS systems require that the patient be brought to the nearest hospital for initial stabilization and evaluation, and there is a mass casualty incident. You should always follow your local protocol when determining the type of transport, and when making the transport decision, also consider if the patient can be transported by ground within a reasonable time, time will take for the aircraft to lift off and land, and then the terrain. So research and trauma care. The military has done extensive research over the many years regarding trauma care. Civilian research shows that what works well in the military does not always work well in the civilian world. For example, the use of pneumatic anti-shock garments for patients with penetrating wounds to the upper body was found to be harmful in the 1980s, even though they were used for many years in Vietnam War. Recent military research has shown that the dangers long associated with tourniquet use are not as serious as they once assumed. And so there's greatly increased tourniquet use in the control of extremity bleeding in the civilian population. Good research should drive the changes in pre-hospital management of trauma patients and only evidence-based 
treatment should be adopted for widespread use. Okay, well this concludes Chapter 29, Trauma Systems and the Mechanisms of Injury Lecture. Thank you for joining us this evening or today, whenever you're listening to this lecture, and we hope you come back and join us for another lecture. Thank you.